Let's do a comprehensive review on acid base imbalances starting with respiratory acidosis. This condition occurs because we have a decrease in lung ventilation and whenever we have that our body starts to retain CO2 carbon dioxide which is going to drop our blood pH. Now what are some things that can lead to this condition and cause us to retain carbon dioxide? Well, let's think about this for a moment. Whenever you're breathing, you're breathing in oxygen and you're breathing out carbon dioxide and you gotta get rid of that carbon dioxide because if you don't, it's gonna lower your blood pH. So any conditions that lower our breathing rate where it causes us to breathe too slow like bradypnea and this is a respiratory rate less than 12 breaths per minute in an adult. Also, if we have damage to those gas exchange structures in our lungs, like those alveolar sacs, where we're not having that proper exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, we can for sure retain too much carbon dioxide and drop our blood pH. In addition, if we have an issue with the muscles that aid in the respiratory rate. For instance, our diaphragm is too weak and we start getting into those neuromuscular disorders that will affect our ability to breathe. So to help us really understand this condition, let's go back and talk about carbon dioxide and gas exchange. So with respiratory acidosis, we have established that we have retained carbon dioxide levels. So what is carbon dioxide anyways? Well, carbon dioxide is a waste product that is created from cell metabolism. And your body needs this certain little range of it, about 35 to 45 uh, millimeters of mercury. Too much of it is bad and too little of it is bad. So here in acidosis, we're talking about having a level greater than 45 because we're retaining way too much CO2. So your body must deal with this carbon dioxide. And what it does is it takes it, dumps it into the blood, and your blood will take it up through the heart to the lungs where gas exchange is going to occur. And it's really cool how gas exchange is in your body because whenever you're breathing in, you're breathing in oxygen. That oxygen goes in through your nose, down into your lungs, and then it's gonna cross over into these little alveoli sacs and it's going to go into your blood and your blood's gonna take it, replenish all your organs with oxygen that it desperately needs. Now, that waste product that's built up in your blood, that carbon dioxide, it's gonna cross over and it's going to go through the alveolar sac, but it's gonna go up through your lungs and you're going to exhale it. And your respiratory rate can adjust itself. It can increase its rate or decrease its rate depending on how much CO2 it needs to get rid of. Now let's back up to whenever CO2 is being created from the cell metabolism. So it's created, it's that waste product. So your body takes it, dumps it into the blood. Now when CO2 enters the blood, it's gonna find some water molecules and it's actually going to bind with water. So CO2 and H2O, they bind together. When they bind together, we get the creation of carbon carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a very weak acid. It doesn't stay together for too long. So whenever we get the formation of it, it actually breaks apart into like hydrogen ions and bicarb. And I want you particularly pay attention to hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions is the thing that really affects our blood pH because whenever we measure blood pH, we're measuring the concentration of hydrogen ions. And hydrogen ions are acidic. So if you have too many hydrogen ions, that is going to drop your blood pH. And remember, a normal blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So it's extremely narrow. So whenever you have too many hydrogen ions hanging out in the body, it's going to make your blood pH less than 7.35. It dropped it. But if we don't have a lot of hydrogen ions, we are going to actually increase our blood pH. It's going to be greater than 7.45. But here in acidosis, we have way too many hydrogen ions on board. So we have a blood pH of less than 7.35. So you may be thinking, what's the big deal about carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions? Well, they're extremely related because whenever we get carbon dioxide binding with water, we get the creation of that weak acid, carbonic acid. Since it's a weak acid, it breaks apart. Whenever it breaks apart, we get hydrogen ions. So if we have a lot of carbon dioxide in our body, let's say we have a patient who has a neuromuscular disease, they're not breathing very well, the respiratory rate is extremely slow, what are they retaining? A lot of carbon dioxide. 
So we have a lot of carbon dioxide hanging out in the blood. That means it's binding with water. When it binds with water, we get carbonic acid being formed, which is gonna start giving us a lot of hydrogen ions in our blood. When we have a lot of hydrogen ions in our blood, that drops our blood pH and makes it acidic, which is why we have respiratory acidosis. So now let's look at some conditions that can lead us to retain carbon dioxide because we've established that we have a depression in lung ventilation. Either we're breathing too slowly, there's damage to the gas exchange structures in our lungs or our respiratory muscles are just too weak to help us exhale this carbon dioxide. So to remember those causes, let's remember the word depress. D is for drugs such as opioids and sedatives. Those are really big ones. They depress your respiratory rate, cause your patient not to breathe very fast. So whenever you do give these medications, you've definitely got to monitor your patient's breathing rate. Also diseases, this goes along with this D, diseases of the neuromuscular system, such as Guillain-Barre syndrome. With that, we start to get paralysis that will extend up to our respiratory system, which will cause your patient not to be able to use the respiratory muscles to breathe, which again will cause us to retain CO2. E is for edema, particularly pulmonary edema. This is where we have fluid in the lungs. Whenever we have fluid hanging out around those alveolar sacs, it's going to prevent proper gas exchange from occurring which also happens with the P of our mnemonic, pneumonia. And then we have R for the respiratory center of the brain is damaged. This can occur in patients who have experienced a stroke. So your breathing rate is really controlled a lot in your brain. And if someone's had ischemia to particular parts of their brain that control the respiratory rate, it can affect how well they're able to ventilate. E is for emphysema. This is where the patient has overinflated alveoli sacs, so we're impairing gas exchange. S is for spasms of the bronchial tubes, like an asthma, again, impairing gas exchange. And then lastly is sac elasticity of alveolar sacs are damaged. And these are in patients who experience COPD. And in patients who have COPD, they are known as being CO2 retainers because we are not having that proper gas exchange in their sac. So one thing you wanna remember about patients who have chronic COPD, meaning they've had this condition for a very long time, they are in this chronic state of acidosis because they retain CO2. And because they've been retaining the CO2 for a long time, their body has adjusted to this. So we have to be extremely careful with the amount of oxygen that we administer to these patients, which we're gonna talk about in nursing interventions. Now let's talk about how you can know if your patient is experiencing respiratory acidosis. One big way is to look at those arterial blood gas values. So let's quickly go over that. So whenever we're talking about respiratory acidosis, the first thing you want to look at is that blood pH. A normal blood pH, as I said before, is 7.35 to 7.45. And again, that was the measurement of those hydrogen ion concentration in our blood. So we have a very acidic blood level. So what do you think that blood pH is going to be in respiratory acidosis? It's going to be less than 7.35. Then we want to look at that PaCO2 level. That is the amount of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood. A normal level is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. So with this condition, we have established that we are retaining carbon dioxide. So what is our level going to be in respiratory acidosis? It's going to be greater than 45 millimeters of mercury. And then another thing we want to look at is the bicarb. This is represented as HCO3. And a normal level is about 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter. So in respiratory acidosis, you can have a normal bicarb level. If this was the case, that would mean that you have no compensation going on, so it would be uncompensated or if we had partial compensation going on, that bicarb level would be greater than 26 because a level that is greater than 26 on that high side is considered alkaline and a level less than 22 is considered acidic. So if we have acidosis going on, our body's in an acid state. So to help compensate, our bicarb can come in because it is a base and it can help put itself on the alkaline side by reserving more bicarb, like our kidneys retaining more bicarb. So hopefully becoming more alkaline, this will help that pH to increase a little bit and get out of that acidic range. Therefore, with this bicarb, our kidneys can play a role with helping conserve some of that bicarb and excrete some of those hydrogen ions so we can get that pH normalized. Now let's look at the signs and symptoms of respiratory acidosis. So a big thing that you're gonna see with these patients is that they are 
going to have some neurostatus changes where before they may have been alert and oriented, but all of a sudden you're noticing that they're getting confused. They're not responding to you properly or while you're actually talking to them, they're falling asleep. So they're getting drowsy and they can report a headache. Plus, they're going to be hypoxic where they have low oxygen in their blood. And that goes back to how we were talking about with the patho. Because of how they're breathing, let's say that their respiratory rate has slowed down, they're not taking in a lot of oxygen. Or if they have damage to their alveolar sacs, we're not having the gas exchange occurring properly where the oxygen is crossing over into the blood. So we're dropping those oxygen levels. And because we're dropping our oxygen levels, our body is going to sense this. So it's going to increase that heart rate in hopes of trying to get more oxygen throughout our body because it desperately needs it. Plus they can have a low blood pressure. Now in clinical practice, whenever I've seen patients with respiratory acidosis, I have noticed the neuro changes and the hypoxia as one of the biggest signs that tip me off that we might have an acid base imbalance. For example, I had a patient come back from surgery and the patient before they left for surgery was alert, oriented, normal. And whenever they came, came back, you know, I knew they were gonna be a little bit drowsy, but as they were supposed to be coming off the sedation and recovering, they were starting to progress get worse. They were getting confused, didn't really know where they were. Um, in addition, while they were talking to me, they would just completely just nod off and fall asleep. And it was very just outwardly told me something was going wrong. And then whenever I had them on their O2 sat monitor, their oxygen was just plummeting downwards. So notified the doctor, got an arterial blood gas, and yes, the patient was in respiratory acidosis. So really pay attention to that neuro status and their oxygen status if they have an O2 monitor. Now let's talk about our role as a nurse where we're providing care to a patient with respiratory acidosis. So we've established that these patients are going to have a low oxygen level because we're retaining carbon dioxide, we have issues with ventilation, gas exchange. So the doctor may order us to administer oxygen. Now with this, you wanna be really careful with what patients you're administering oxygen to and how much. So look at your patient's health history because as we were talking about in our mnemonic, that last part, where we're talking about patients who have COPD, whenever a patient has chronic COPD, they are in this chronic state of acidosis because they are retaining CO2. And their body has actually compensated for this and has become used to these high CO2 levels. So a low oxygen level actually guides their respiratory function. So you want to be really careful that you don't go too high with their oxygen levels because it could decrease their breathing rate. In addition, whenever we have a patient with respiratory acidosis, we wanna make sure we are paying attention to their respiratory status, how are they breathing, what's their rate, and we wanna look at their neuro status. Because again, as I was talking about with signs and symptoms, that is one of the most subtle changes that I have seen whenever a patient starts to experience this condition. Plus, if your patient, let's say, has pneumonia or they have some type of issue going on with gas exchange, coughing and deep breathing, using that incentive spirometer can help improve gas exchange. So we wanna educate the patient on that, this and how to do it. And if your patient has a lot of fluid in the lungs, suctioning could be helpful along with providing mouth care because studies have shown that the bacteria in our mouth, if it gets down into our lungs, it could lead to pneumonia. So we wanna make sure that we're routinely cleaning that mouth from those secretions. And bronchodilators can be beneficial. So administering a breathing treatment can go in there, dilate those airways so we can improve gas exchange and holding any medications that could decrease their respiratory rate. So if you have a patient with respiratory acidosis, go look at their medication history or their what they're currently receiving and ask yourself, is there anything in this list that could be decreasing their breathing rate? We don't wanna give that to them right now. And we wanna make sure that we're monitoring their electrolytes because whenever acidosis presents, it can affect potassium levels. 
because it will cause potassium to leave the inside of the cell and go to the outside of the cell, the extracellular compartment, which is our blood plasma, which could lead to hyperkalemia. And if we get hyperkalemia, this can affect our heart, causing dysrhythmia. So we wanna make sure we're watching the ECG as well. And then lastly, if the patient's CO2 levels are getting really too high, they may need some help blowing off that carbon dioxide. So they may be intubated so they can get mechanical ventilation where we can actually decrease those CO2 levels. So you wanna help get your patient prepped for that. Now let's focus on respiratory alkalosis. Respiratory alkalosis occurs in the body whenever we have increased lung ventilation. So whenever a patient is increasing their lung ventilation, unfortunately, this causes the CO2 level in your body, the carbon dioxide level, to drop down but it causes the pH level to increase. So we now have an alkalotic state in the body. So one of the main causes of respiratory alkalosis is actually called tachypnea. And tachypnea, tach means fast, is a really fast respiratory rate. Typically in adults, this is greater than 20 breaths per minute. So we don't want someone breathing that fast. So let's think about it for a second. You have this person, they are breathing extremely fast. What is coming out of their mouth? What are they exhaling whenever they're breathing really fast? They're exhaling carbon dioxide, CO2. And we don't wanna get rid of too much of this. So here with respiratory alkalosis, we have already said that we have a low carbon dioxide level. So when you have a low carbon dioxide level, you don't have a lot of carbon dioxide binding with water. You're not getting the formation of a lot of carbonic acid, which is a weak acid. And therefore, whenever it breaks apart, you're not getting a lot of hydrogen ions. So we're dropping our hydrogen ions, which is increasing our blood pH. So do you see why whenever we have a low CO2 carbon dioxide level, we have a high blood pH, so we have alkalosis. And again, the main cause is tachypnea. So whenever the patient is breathing really fast, they're exhaling that CO2. So what are some conditions or things that could cause your patient to breathe really fast? Well, to help us remember those things, let's remember the word tachypnea. T is for temperature increase fever so whenever your patient has a really high fever it can cause them to breathe really fast and blow off co2 putting them in respiratory alkalosis a is for aspirin toxicity like salicylates c for controlled ventilation is too excessive so we have them on some type of mechanical ventilation it's just way too fast for them and they're just blowing off too much co2 H is for hyperventilation. Whenever patients get a lot of anxiety, if you've ever seen one, someone having a panic attack or severe anxiety, notice that they really breathe very fast. This can cause this. And then Y is for Yelp. They have pain. Whenever a patient's in pain, it will affect their vital signs. Their heart rate can go up, their blood pressure can go up, along with their respiratory rate. Then P for pneumothorax. This is where we have a collapsed lung. So whenever you have a collapsed lung, that's definitely gonna alter gas exchange and affect how well you can get rid of carbon dioxide. N is for neuro change. We're talking about our brain, like inflammation of the brain or brain injury. We know that there are centers in our brain that control our respiratory rate. So if those are inflamed or damaged, it can affect how the patient breathes, which could cause them to go into an alkalotic state. E is for embolism in the lungs, and then A is for ascending altitude. So whenever you go up in altitude, you have low oxygen. And whenever you have low oxygen, your body's like, hey, I need to breathe some more. So it might try to hyperventilate to try to take in more oxygen. Well, when you're hyperventilating, as we've already talked about, you're gonna blow off too much CO2. Now let's talk about how a patient's arterial blood gases are gonna look whenever they're experiencing respiratory alkalosis. How can you tell whenever you look at that blood gas that your patient has this condition. Well, you wanna look at three specific things. One thing is the blood pH. Again, that pH is telling us the concentration of hydrogen ions in the blood. So a normal blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So whenever we're talking less than 7.35, we're talking about the blood being really acidic. So if it's really acidic, we got a lot of hydrogen ions in there. If it's greater than 7.45, 
we don't have a lot of hydrogen ions in there, so the blood is alkalotic. And that is the case with respiratory alkalosis. We're gonna have a blood pH of greater than 7.45. Then we wanna look at the PaCO2, which is the concentration of carbon dioxide in that arterial blood. A normal level is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. So with this PaCO2 level, anything that's less than 35 is going to be considered alkalotic. Anything greater than 45 is considered acidic. So here we don't have a lot of carbon dioxide, so it's going to be, you'll see results less than 35 millimeters of mercury, which is on the alkalotic side. Then you want to quickly look at the bicarb level, the HCO3. So this tells us if we got some compensation going on. This value can be normal or it could be abnormal. So a normal bicarb level is about 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter. So anything with this bicarb when it's less than 22 is considered to be on the acidotic side and anything greater than 26 is on the alkalotic side. So again, it could be normal. If it was normal and all those, the blood pH and the PaCO2 were abnormal showing the values for what it should be for respiratory alkalosis, we would have respiratory alkalosis, no compensation, so it'd be uncompensated. But if this bicarb was less than 22 and we have the abnormal values for blood pH and the PaCO2 which is telling us respiratory alkalosis and our bicarb is less than 22 we would have partial compensation because this bicarb is trying to make things a little bit more acidic for us so we can bring that blood pH down because right now it's too high we need to bring it down so with compensation our body has a lot of systems in place to help balance these acids and bases so we can get our blood ph back into 7.35 to 7.45 range and we have you know the hydrogen ions which are our acids but we also have bases and a big base in our body that our body likes to use is bicarb the hco3 so here in this case we really have too much basic stuff going on so we can get the kidneys involved and the kidneys help tweak bicarb and hydrogen ions. So what the kidneys can do is that it can excrete the extra bicarb because we don't need too much of that because we already have alkalosis and it can start to retain hydrogen ions which again are acidic. So if we're going to add hydrogen ions back into our blood we can make it a little bit more acidic and hopefully decrease that blood pH which is why you're going to start to see this bicarb level start to decrease get less than 22. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of respiratory alkalosis. So we just talked about how they're going to look on a sheet of paper with their blood gas results. But what are they going to be presenting with whenever you go in and you look at them? Well, one big sign and symptom you're going to see, of course, is an increased respiratory rate. You're also going to start to see neuro changes as it progresses to get worse. So you could start to see anxiety, especially if this is caused by a panic attack. You're going to start to see fear, dizziness, which could progress to seizures in severe cases. In addition, their heart rate can be elevated and you particularly want to pay attention to this heart rate because they can start to experience ECG changes. And these ECG changes are going to come from electrolyte imbalances, which can be very serious. So two electrolyte imbalances, I want you to remember that can occur with respiratory alkalosis. They are hypocalcemia and hypokalemia. So we're talking about a low calcium level in the blood and a low potassium level in the blood. So why is this occurring? Well, first let's talk about the low potassium level. So whenever a patient has a low carbon dioxide level in the blood, like in this condition, it causes potassium to move inside that cell, so intracellular which drops our blood levels. Now with calcium, what happens is that whenever the blood pH becomes too alkalotic, it causes calcium to misbehave in a sense. It causes calcium to want to bind to albumin. And when it binds to albumin, it's no longer in our blood. It drops our blood level, so we'll have a low calcium level. Now, because of these electrolyte imbalances, it could cause not only the ECG changes, but your patient could start to have muscle cramping and tetany as well. So what is our role with respiratory alkalosis? What are our interventions and what treatments can we expect to be ordered? So with respiratory alkalosis, the big thing is that we want to find the cause and we want to fix that cause because if the patient's having a fever, let's give them some antipyretics to decrease that fever. If they're having anxiety, let's help get them calm. Whatever it is, you want to find it 
and treat it. So the big thing is, is we want the patient to decrease the respiratory rate and rest because if we can get them to slow that respiratory rate, it's going to decrease how much carbon dioxide they are putting out, ex expelling. So to help us remember our role, we're going to remember the word rest. R is for rebreather mask or paper bag. So just helping them slow down their respiratory rate, it's gonna slow down how much carbon dioxide they're gonna be putting out. So these are very simple things that we can do to help possibly correct that imbalance. E is for electrolytes monitored, particularly again, what were those two big electro electrolytes? They were potassium and calcium. S is for sedatives or anti-anxiety medications to be administered. This is just gonna help calm them down, which when we calm them down, they're gonna decrease their breathing and again, quit hyperventilating. And then T is for teach relaxation and de-stressing techniques. So the big thing, if you have a patient who goes into respiratory alkalosis because of stress, anxiety, a big thing is teaching them prevention. What are some things that they can do to prevent this from happening? Avoiding certain situations. And then whenever the attack comes on, what they can do to help decrease that breathing and decrease the stress associated with it. Now let's break down metabolic acid. Acidosis. Metabolic acidosis occurs whenever we have too many acids in the body. And this leads our blood pH to fall along with our bicarb level, which is the HCO3 level. Now, this tends to occur really due to two reasons. The first reason being there is just too much acid production in the body. Some process in the body is messed up and we have way too many acids hanging out there. Or secondly, there is failure of our body to actually excrete or rid itself of these acids. So what are some things that can do this? Well, to help us remember those things, let's remember the word acids. So A is for accumulation of lactate, which leads to lactic acidosis. And this happens in cases of sepsis. C is for chronic diarrhea, where the patient is just losing too much bicarb through their stool. So bicarb is is this like basic substance. It helps neutralize acids. And if we're losing a lot of the substance that helps neutralize acids, we're losing the ability to keep those acids in control, which could lead to acidosis. I is for impaired renal function. So your kidneys play a huge role in helping you balance those acids in your body. It can help get rid of those hydrogen ions. So if we have kidneys that aren't working very well, we're gonna start to have high amounts of waste, hence acids in the body, which leads us to acidosis. And then D for DKA, which stands for diabetic ketoacidosis. So already in that name, you see acidosis. So we're dealing with something that's acidic. And with this condition, we have an increase of ketone production, which is acidic and causes our blood pH to fall. And then lastly, we have for S, salicylate toxicity. So these are acidic substances. So if a patient has too much of these in their system, it could cause acidosis. Now to help us understand metabolic acidosis a little bit better, let's take a moment and talk about acids. So your body metabolizes substance to function. This process is gonna break down fats, carbs, and proteins, and it's gonna take energy from that and give it to us. Now, unfortunately, a byproduct of this process is the creation of acids. So what are acids? Well, these are materials that once broken down in a solution, they create hydrogen ions. And this is what a pH level measures, the hydrogen ion concentration. And our body needs a narrow pH range in order to function. It needs a range between 7.35 to 7.45. Anything less than 7.35 is too acidic, and anything greater than 7.45 is too alkaline. So hydrogen ions play a huge role in affecting our pH level. It actually decreases the level and makes the body acidic. So if you have too many hydrogen ions in the body, that is going to lower our blood pH and make it less than 7.35. If you don't have a lot of hydrogen ions in the body, it's going to raise that blood pH and make it greater than 7.45, making it too alkaline. Now, 
know, our body knows that this can happen. So it has these systems in place to help balance this out. The body wants a 20 to one ratio of bases versus acids. So for every 20 bases you have, it wants one acid. So it can keep the acid base balance. So the body uses systems to remove and neutralize these acids. And what really neutralizes an acid? A base. So bases neutralize acids. And the body can use the respiratory and the renal system to help remove or conserve them. Now, how do we get the creation of hydrogen ions in the body? Well, it's through carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a weak acid in the body that plays a role in acid base balance. It comes from carbon dioxide and it's formed when carbon dioxide binds with water in the body. So when you breathe in and you take in carbon dioxide, it enters your blood, it's gonna bind with that water. Whenever those two bind together, it forms carbonic acid. Now, carbonic acid is weak. It doesn't stay together too long. It actually breaks apart and creates hydrogen ions. And hydrogen ions can neutralize bases. So now let's take a deeper look into the respiratory and renal system that helps us balance these acids and bases. With the respiratory system, it will control the carbon dioxide levels. Either it will cause us to retain CO2 or blow off CO2. So it will control the rate of how fast we breathe and how deep we breathe. With acidosis, one of the big things you're gonna see with these patients because their body's trying to compensate for this is that they're gonna have fast, deep breathing, known as cosmol breathing. And why their body is doing this is because it's trying to blow off all that carbon dioxide. Now, why does your body wanna blow off carbon dioxide? Well, what we just discussed is whenever carbon dioxide enters the body, it hits the blood, binds with water, we get the formation of carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a weak acid, it breaks apart, and it's going to affect our hydrogen ions. Too many hydrogen ions in the body lowers that blood pH. So if we can get rid of that extra carbon dioxide through breathing, we can alter carbonic acid, which is gonna alter hydrogen ion concentration. So in hopes we're going to increase that blood pH to normal. Now the respiratory system usually does this within minutes, so it's a pretty fast acting system. However, the renal system, I like to refer to it as the slow and steady system. Once it takes over, it does a pretty good job of helping us balance the acid and bases, but it can take up to days. So what a renal system can do is that it can mess with the bicarb levels, the HCO3. So we've learned that HCO3 bicarb, it's basic, it neutralizes acid. So if we're hanging out in some acidotic conditions like with metabolic acidosis, we need us some bicarb. So the kidneys, they know this. So what they can try to do is they can start to retain bicarb, which will help neutralize those acids. We neutralize acids, we incre increase blood pH back up. Plus, the kidneys, specifically those nephrons within the kidneys, can start tweaking the hydrogen ion concentration. So we can start excreting extra hydrogen ions. Now, how are a patient's arterial blood gas results gonna look whenever they're in metabolic acidosis? Because ABGs is one of the great ways we can tell if a patient is in this type of acid-base imbalance. So whenever you look at those ABGs, you're gonna look at three things. You're gonna look at the blood pH. Again, what was a normal? 7.35 to 7.45. So with acidosis, it's going to be less than 7.35. Next, you wanna look at that bicarb level, the HCO3. A normal level is 22 to 26 milli equivalents per liter. With acidosis, because we're talking about metabolic acidosis, HCO3, that's telling us we're dealing with a metabolic disorder, it's gonna be less than 22 on the acidic side. And then the PaCO2, which represents our respiratory system, a normal level of that is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. With acidosis, it could be normal, so it could be within that normal range, but if the respiratory system is trying to compensate, like how we just talked about a moment ago, that level will be less than 35 because it's telling us it's trying to lower those carbon dioxide levels. So if it was that and our blood pH was still abnormal, it would be partially compensating. So we just seen what some ABG results can look like on a patient in metabolic acidosis, but how's the patient gonna look whenever you're in their room assessing them? Well, number one, we established that their breathing rate is going to be abnormal. They're gonna have that cough small breathing where it's fast and deep. And why are they doing that? to breathe off that CO2. Also, neurally, they're gonna be confused, they can be weak, their blood pressure can be affected. Another big thing is you wanna look at their ECG. 
you want to make sure that their T waves are abnormal because they can present with hyperkalemia. Acidosis leads to this. Now, why is this? Well, whenever a patient has severe acidosis, it causes the potassium inside the cell intercellularly to move outside the cell extracellularly, which is going to elevate those levels. Now, what are some nursing interventions for the patient that you want to remember? Well, one thing you want to remember is that with metabolic acidosis, they need to find the cause and treat it. And there's a lot of causes that can lead to metabolic acidosis when we talked about our mnemonic acid. So the treatments will vary depending on the cause. Therefore, as a nurse, one thing you really gotta keep an eye on is the patient's electrolyte level. So one level you wanna pay attention to is that potassium level, which is what we just talked about. So you're looking for hyperkalemia, but here is the thing about it. Once this acidosis starts resolving, especially in a patient who has diabetic ketoacidosis, what can happen is that you're gonna have a problem with hypokalemia. So now we're gonna be dealing with a low potassium level. And why is that? Well, a lot of times with DKA, one of the interventions you're gonna be doing per the doctor's orders is you're gonna be administering IV fluids and insulin. So whenever we give insulin, what insulin does is that it will cause potassium to actually move inside that cell. When we move it out of the blood inside the cell, we can cause hypokalemia. So you wanna monitor for that. You also wanna make sure that you're monitoring the patient's neurostatus and that you're ensuring their safety. And some IV fluids that could be given, again, this varies depending on why your patient's in metabolic acidosis, but some fluids could include sodium bicarb or normal saline. And if this is being caused by renal failure, the patient can go for dialysis, which will, in a sense, act as the kidneys and filter out the blood and help increase our blood pH back to normal. Now let's take a look at metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis results in an elevated blood pH and an elevated bicarbonate level, HCO3. And this usually occurs because we've had excessive loss of acids such as hydrogen ions, or we've had an increase in the amount of bases like bicarbonate, that HCO3. Now, what are some conditions that could cause either of these two things to happen? Well, to help us remember those conditions, let's remember the word alkali. Alkali is a synonym for base. First, we have A for acid loss via the stomach. Your stomach acid is really rich in hydrogen ions. So if we are over suctioning the patient, removing too much of their GI juice, or they're vomiting, they're losing a lot of hydrogen ions, which when we drop hydrogen ion concentration, we increase that blood pH because all blood pH is is measuring the concentration of hydrogen ions in the body. Then we have L for low chloride level. When we have a low chloride level in the body, this causes our kidneys to start to decrease its excretion of bicarbonate. So when we decrease excreting bicarbonate in our urine, that's actually going to raise the levels in our body. When we have too much bases, they are going to neutralize those acids, which will throw us into these alkalotic conditions. And then we have K for potassium loss. So whenever we have hypokalemia in a patient, what happens is that it really affects hydrogen ions. It causes those hydrogen ions to move inside the cell. So instead of being in the fluid surrounding that cell, in that extracellular fluid, it will start to migrate inward, which will drop our hydrogen ion amounts, which is going to increase our blood pH. Then we have A for aldosterone increase. So whenever we have a condition like hyperaldosteronism, we have a high level of aldosterone in the body, it's gonna do three things. One thing is it's gonna cause our body to keep sodium, which in the end is gonna cause us to waste more hydrogen ions. Again, we're losing our hydrogen ions, which raises our blood pH and keep bicarb. And then we have L for loop and thiazide diuretics. These diuretics, they increase urinary output, but also in that urine will be potassium. So we're at risk for hypokalemia. And whenever we put a patient in hypokalemia, we just learned it messes with the hydrogen ion concentration, which will increase the risk of developing metabolic alkalosis. And then lastly, I for infusing too much sodium bicarb IV. So this could happen if the patient was in, let's say, metabolic acidosis, where they were ordered sodium bicarbonate. They received too much, so now we flipped them over into alkalosis. 
because bicarb in that sodium bicarb fluid acts as a base. So if we give them too much of a base, that will go in there, neutralize too many hydrogen ions, which we don't want, and send them into alkalosis. Now to help us understand metabolic alkalosis a little bit better, let's talk more in depth about bases. Bases are materials that once you break them down in a solution, they neutralize acids by binding with the hydrogen ions. So in a sense, what it does is it acquires a hydrogen ion and then neutralizes. It. And an important base in the body is called bicarbonate, HCO3. And this is actually a weak base that will help neutralize, hence bind to acids like hydrogen ions. And when they do this, they increase the pH level. Now your body has these internal systems that help maintain this acid-base balance. The two systems I want to talk about are the respiratory and renal system. With the respiratory system, it works fairly fast whenever we have an acid-base imbalance. And how it works is that it affects carbon dioxide levels by causing you to change your respiratory rate and depth. For example, your respiratory system can cause you to breathe faster and deeper. And whenever you're doing that, think about what's happening. What are you blowing off if you're breathing really fast and deep? You're blowing off carbon dioxide. And this is really beneficial whenever you are experiencing acidosis. On the flip side, your respiratory system can cause you to breathe slower. So think about it. Whenever you're breathing slower, what are you keeping more of? You're keeping more of carbon dioxide. And this is very beneficial whenever you have alkalosis going on where you're too basic because keeping carbon dioxide is going to cause you to create more hydrogen ions. So a lot of times whenever you have a patient in an alkalotic state, you will see that they have bradypnea, where their respirations are slow. They're having hypoventilation. And the whole purpose of this is to keep that carbon dioxide because when we keep the carbon dioxide that stays in our blood, that carbon dioxide is going to bind with water. When it binds with water, it's going to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a weak acid and it breaks apart. When it breaks apart, it increases hydrogen ions. Those hydrogen ions will go in there and neutralize the bicarbonate. Whenever we neutralize the bicarbonate, that is going to help bring down that blood pH to normal. And then the renal system will come into play. Now, I like to think of the renal system as the slow and steady system. It's like the turtle. It's slow, but once it gets going, it does its thing. So with this system, what's going to happen is it is going to help retain hydrogen ions. So why do we need hydrogen ions? Because they're going to help make things more acidic, which is really needed when we have metabolic alkalosis. So those hydrogen ions will go and neutralize that bicarbonate. Plus, the kidneys can start to excrete extra bicarb, which again will help lower that blood pH. Now, one of the ways you can tell that your patients in metabolic alkalosis is that you can look at their arterial blood gas results, their ABGs. So what are ABGs gonna look like in a person with metabolic alkalosis? Well, there's three things you gotta look at. You gotta look at the blood pH, the bicarbonate level, and the PaCO2. So the blood pH, again, a normal was what? 7.35 to 7.45. With this, the blood pH is going to be greater than 7.45. It's going to be on the alkaline side. The bicarbonate, which represents our metabolic system, a normal is 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter. And with this, it's going to be elevated. So it's going to be greater than 26. It's going to be on the alkaline side. And then our PaCO2, which represents our respiratory system, it can be one of two things. It could be normal or it could be elevated. So a normal level is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. If the body isn't trying to compensate, that respiratory, the PaCO2, is going to be normal because our body hasn't decreased our respiration yet in hope of retaining that CO2. So it'll just be within that 35 to 45 range. However, if it was trying to compensate, like partially compensate, it would start to cause your respiratory system to keep that CO2. So you would start to see the CO2 levels rise and they would be greater than 45. Now that we know what a patient's arterial blood gases will look like with metabolic alkalosis, how will they be presenting with their signs and symptoms? A big one you're gonna see is bradypnea. That's those slow respirations. Now that's a compensatory mechanism, but it can become really severe where it leads to respiratory failure. And 
the patient can have dysrhythmia. So you really want to pay attention to their ECG because this is arising from hypokalemia where we have a low potassium level. So whenever a patient has a low potassium level, you want to look specifically at that ST segment. With a low potassium level, it will be depressed. And you'll want to look at their T wave, which could be inverted, like flipped upside down. Now, normally after the T wave is a flat line, but whenever you have hypokalemia where it's severe, you can actually have what's called a U wave after that T wave. Also arising from this low potassium level could be tetany, tremors, muscle cramping, they can feel tired and irritable. What are some nursing interventions for the patient with metabolic alkalosis? Well, of course, we want to monitor that ECG, the respiratory status, and neurostatus. We also want to keep an eye on their electrolyte levels, particularly potassium due to hypokalemia and that chloride level, which could be hypochloremia. So the healthcare provider may order supplementation that you will be administering to the patient. And if the patient is vomiting, we want to address that because remember those GI juices are really rich in hydrogen ions and we need to keep those hydrogen ions in this condition. So an antiemetic may be ordered. Also certain diuretics may need to be held, particularly those loop and thiazide diuretics. And the reason for that is because they drop our potassium level and when we drop our potassium level way too low it affects hydrogen ion concentration making alkalosis worse and sometimes a medication can be ordered called acetazolamide which brand name is diamox and this is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and it's actually a diuretic and what it does is it decreases the reabsorption of bicarb so we're not keeping more bicarb instead it's going to help us excrete it via the urine which is really helpful when we're in alkalosis now let's talk about the abg sample collection process by reviewing the modified allen test the modified allen test is performed before collecting an arterial blood gas on the radial artery. Now, what is an arterial blood gas? This is also sometimes referred to as an ABG, and it's a blood test that's collected from an artery that assesses the oxygenation and acid-base balance of a patient. And the blood sample for this test can be obtained through an arterial line, also known as an ART line. And think of this as like direct access to a patient's radial artery. A lot of patients who are in the ICU have an arterial line, or it can be obtained through a needle stick via an artery. The most common artery used for this type of test typically is the radial artery, but the femoral and the brachial artery can be used as well. Now, why do we do a modified Allen test before we collect an arterial blood gas sample from the radial artery. Well, let's talk about the radial artery for a moment. So find your thumb located just below your thumb over where your radial bone would be is your radial artery and you can feel it pulsating. And then just next door on the other side where your ulna bone is located, that's your ulnar artery. Now these two arteries work together to deliver fresh oxygenated blood to your hand and its structures. And we always wanna make sure that these arteries can do that. So this modified Allen test is going to check blood flow to the hand to ensure there is good collateral blood flow to the hand in case that radial artery develops problems after the ABG collection. So in other words, it wants to make sure that your ulnar artery can work as backup in case we need it. So now let me demonstrate how to perform the modified Allen test. Before you perform the modified Allen test, you wanna turn the patient's hand so the palm is facing up, have the patient make a clenched fist and then find the radial and ulnar artery. And to help you remember the steps of this test, remember the word Allen. First, you're gonna apply firm pressure to the radial and ulnar artery at the same time with your thumbs or fingertips. This will temporarily stop blood flow to the hand. Then let the patient open and close their hands several times. The hand will start to lose its color, hence it's going to appear lighter or blanched. Loosen pressure on the ulnar artery only, but keep pressure on the radial artery. Then evaluate the return of blood flow from the ulnar artery to the hand. A normal response will be that the hand returns to normal color, hence appears flush within less than five seconds. And if this is the case, you know that this radial artery is good to go for collecting an arterial blood gas. Now that we've reviewed that material, let's focus on solving arterial blood gas problems. You can solve these problems in many ways, but first I'm gonna demonstrate the tic-tac-toe method. The tic-tac-toe method is a method you can use to solve arterial blood gases. And it's very 
similar to the childhood game that you may have played as a kid where you set up the little grid lines and you use X's and O's and you're trying to get that three in a row. It has the same concept, except we're not using X's and O's, we're using arterial blood gas values like PaCO2, bicarbon, pH, and we're not um, just getting any type of three in a row. We have to get a vertical three in a row. So I'm talking about a three in a row that goes up and down. So first, let's look at an overview of how this method is set up. So whenever I go to solve these problems, because I want to be solving uncompensated ones, partial and full compensation, you'll have a little bit of an idea as I'm setting up this problem. So here is a completed one. I want you to look at the grids. Notice how we set up the grids, just how you would in a childhood tic-tac-toe and we've labeled each like column so you have acid over there all the way to the left then you have normal in the middle and then you have base all the way at the right then we've plugged in our arterial blood gas results so we've had to interpret them so we've plugged in the PaCO2, that represents the respiratory system. We figured out that that was normal, so we put it under the normal column. Then we looked at the pH and it is basic, so we put that under the basic column. And then the HCO3 was basic, which represents the metabolic system, and we put it under the basic side. So now we're looking at the tic-tac-toe, we're looking for that three in a row, and we're looking for a vertical three in a row. So we got one right here with base pH and HCO3. So how do we interpret what it is? Well, you say base, which is another way of saying base is alkalotic. It's alkalotic and the pH is alkalotic and the HCO3 is considered alkalotic. So when we put all that together, we get metabolic alkalosis. And this problem is uncompensated, which we'll be going over that here in a second. So that is how you set up the problem. Now, before you even go working these problems, you have to first have a basic understanding of how to interpret ABG results. So let's quickly go over that. First thing, whenever you're looking at ABG results, you need to look at the patient's blood pH. This is like the measure of the hydrogen ion concentration. So your body likes a narrow range. 7.35 to 7.45 is the range that's considered normal. So anything less than 7.35 is considered acidotic and acid and anything greater than 7.45 is considered basic which another way of saying basic is alkalotic those are like synonyms you can interchange those the next you want to look at the PaCO2 this is the carbon dioxide level concentration in the arterial blood whenever we're talking about PaCO2 that always represents the respiratory system so remember that so a normal level is about 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury so when you're looking at these results, anything that's less than 35 is considered alkalotic, basic, and anything that is greater than 45 is considered acidotic and acid. Then you wanna look at the bicarb, which is HCO3. This always represents the metabolic system. So HCO3, metabolic, PaCO2 is respiratory. So a normal bicarb level is anywhere between 22 to 26 of uh, milliequivalents per liter. So anything that is less than 22 is an acid and anything greater than 26 is a base. Now, whenever you're looking at these lab results and you're thinking, how am I going to memorize this? Try to keep these few things in mind. One thing is about that respiratory system. It's a little bit special when it comes to its values. It's the opposite on whether it's an acid or a base compared to pH and the bicarb. Because notice with pH and bicarb, it's low values like 7.35 or 22 are automatically considered an acid. But when we go over here and look at PaCO2, it's low value, that 35, it's considered a base. So notice it's opposite. Always remember that or you'll get confused. In addition, remember 35 to 45, because if you can remember that number, you've knocked out two of the values. For instance, 7.35 to 7.45 is a normal pH. See the 35 and the 45? And then remember for PaCO2 respiratory, it's 35 to 45, that's its normal. So if you remember those two uh, numbers, you've just memorized two values. So now let me test you. Okay, you have a blood pH of 7.52. What is that? It is a base, so it's alkalotic. In your tic-tac-toe, you put it on the base side. How about a PaCO2 of 32? That is a base, it's considered alkalotic. How about a bicarb HCO3 of 28? It's considered basic, alkalotic. 
Okay, how about a pH of 7.31? That is acidic, we put it on the acid side. And how about the pH was 7.36? That's normal, so you put it under the normal side. So these next problems we're gonna solve are actually from my book I just released on ABG interpretation. And in this book, I include a lot of practice problems to make sure you know how to solve all these different types of ABG problems, along with cheat sheet style notes to help you remember those important concepts about acid base imbalances and so forth. So now that we have that out of the way, let's set up our first tic-tac-toe problem. Okay. Patient's ABG results are pH of 7.25, a PaCO2 of 50, and a bicarb HCO3 of 24. So the very first thing you want to do is that you want to set up the problem. So go ahead, put out your lines, and then label each column. We have acid all the way over there on the left, we have normal in the middle, and then we have base here on the right. So the first thing what you want to do is you want to interpret those results. Let's start with the blood pH. The pH is 7.25. That is acidic. So we're going to write pH under the acid column. Then we're going to look at the PaCO2. It was 50. That is considered an acid. So we're going to put PaCO2 under acid. And I'm seeing something. I'm seeing some vertical activity going on, but let's finish out the problem. And then um, we're going to look at the bicarb, the HCO3. It is 24. So that is normal. So we're going to put our bicarb under normal. So again, just remember PaCO2 represented the respiratory system and uh, the bicarb, the HCO3 represented the metabolic system. So now what we're going to do is we're asking ourselves, do we see a vertical three in a row? And the answer is yes, we do. So we can actually finish solving this. So what we have is we're going to say acid plus pH plus PaCO2. What do we get when we do that? We're going to get respiratory acidosis and it's uncompensated. So we don't have any compensation going on. What, how would we know if we had any, where it would be a partial compensation instead of uncompensated? Well, our HCO3, which is the system that's not the imbalance, should be trying to help us correct these acidotic conditions by becoming more alkaline. So that bicarb, the HCO3, should be going up, being greater than 26 if it was partial compensated and our pH was still abnormal. So that would be partial compensation. But right now our bicarb is normal. So it's not trying to make itself more alkalotic. So it's staying within that normal range, so it's uncompensated. But let's say that whenever we did this tic-tac-toe, we didn't have a vertical three in a row because that sometimes happens. And when that happens, it automatically tips you off. You have full compensation, which I'm gonna go more into detail about that when we solve those problems. Plus, if it was full compensation, our pH would have been normal. So if you don't get a vertical three in a row and your pH is normal, you can know that you do have full compensation. So with this problem, it says our patient has the following ABGs, a pH of 7.26, a PaCO2 of 31, and an HCO3 of 20. So very first thing what we wanna do is we want to set up that tic-tac-toe. So set up our problems, label each column, acid, normal, and base. Then what we want to do is we want to interpret that blood pH. Is it acidic, normal, or basic, alkalotic? So um, our blood pH was 7.26. That is on the acidic side. So we're going to put pH under acid. Then we're going to look at the PaCO2. It was 31. That is on the base side. So we're going to put that under base. And then we're going to look at the bicarb, the HCO3, and it was 20. And when we interpret that, that is going to go under acid. So we're gonna put that there. Now we're gonna look for a vertical three in a row. Do we see one? We do, we have one over here on the acid side. Acid plus pH plus bicarb. Again, what did HCO3 represent? It represented metabolic. So when we put all of that together, we get metabolic acidosis. So now, we need to determine what kind of compensation we got going on. So we know this is not full compensation because as I started out before, we do have a vertical three in a row, 
plus our pH is abnormal. Our pH would have to be normal for it to be full compensation. So we'll go ahead and forget about that one. So it's either uncompensated or partial compensated. So we need to further look at the system that isn't causing our imbalance. Our system that is causing the imbalance is the metabolic system. So we know we have metabolic acidosis. So let's look over at that respiratory system value and it's represented by the PaCO2. When we look at that, we put it under the base side. So it is abnormal. So the respiratory system is trying to compensate by making itself more alkalotic in hopes of bringing that pH to normal. So we have metabolic acidosis partially compensated. In our next problem, the patient has a pH of 7.54, a PaCO2 of 27, and a bicarb of 23. So first thing we do is we set up our tic-tac-toe grid with acid, normal, and base. Now let's interpret that pH. The pH is 7.54. What is that? Acid, base, or normal? Our pH is basic, alkalotic, so we're going to put that under base. Now let's look at the PaCO2. It is 27. That is basic, alkalotic, so we're going to put that under base. And then our bicarb HCO3, it is 23. So a normal one for that was 22 to 26. So we're going to put that under normal. Okay, next thing, we've interpreted everything. Now we need to see, do we have a vertical three in a row? The answer is yes, we do. It's on that base side. So when we take base plus pH plus PaCO2, again, represent the respiratory system, we get respiratory alkalosis. So now we need to determine what kind of compensation we have going on. We can go ahead, throw out full compensation because we don't because we do have a vertical three in a row and our blood pH is abnormal. So is this uncompensated or partial compensated? So let's look at that system's value that isn't causing our problem. The problem is being caused by the respiratory system. So let's look at the metabolic systems representation, which was by the bicarb. The bicarb is normal. It's within that normal range. So it's not really trying to compensate by throwing itself in more acidic value. So we would say it is respiratory alkalosis uncompensated. This problem says our patient has a pH of 7.36, a PaCO2 of 50, and an HCO3 of 31. So first thing we're going to do is set up that tic-tac-toe grid, label it acid normal base. Then what we want to do is we want to interpret that pH. So let's analyze our pH is 7.36. Okay, that is normal, it falls within that 7.35 to 7.45 range. So we're gonna put pH under normal. Okay, right now we're already thinking, hmm, I think we got full compensation, but let's further analyze everything else. Next, we're gonna look at the PaCO2. It was 50. This falls on the acid side, so we're gonna put that under acid. And then our HCO3 is 31, and that falls under the basic side, so it's alkalotic, so we're gonna put it under base. Now we need to see, do we have that vertical three in a row? The answer is no, we don't. So we know we're dealing with full compensation, but we need to figure out what type of disorder this actually is. So what we wanna do is further look at that blood pH. So we know it's 7.36 and the normal range is 7.35 to 7.45, but the absolute normal smack dab right in the middle is 7.35. Four, zero. So we're going to use 7.40 as our home base. So we have a line here drawn and in the middle right there is 7.40. So we're normal, but are we acidic normal on that blood pH or are we alkalotic normal on that blood pH? And how you figure that out is anything that is less than 7.40 is considered acidotic normal, and anything greater than 7.40 is considered alkalotic normal. So here, because we're 7.36, we're considered to be on that acidic side. So we've established that we have a normal pH, but it's acidic. Now let's look at that system, either respiratory or metabolic, that matches also being acidic, because that's the type of disorder we most likely have. So. We have PaCO2 under acid and we have HCO3 under base. So what's under acid? Our respiratory system, the PaCO2. So we have respiratory acidosis, full compensated. And how this full compensation was achieved was that our bicarb or HCO3 
threw itself into an alkalotic value, a basic value, which helped increase that pH back to normal, but it's normal, but it's a little acidic normal because it just came from being on the acid side. So now it's hopefully trending upward and it was helped by this bicarb by making itself alkalotic. The Rome method is another way to solve these ABG problems. So let me demonstrate this method. So Rome is an acronym that stands for respiratory opposite metabolic equal. And whenever you're using this method to help you solve arterial blood gases, I really recommend that you keep the R and the O together and the M and the E together. Think of them going together because it'll help you understand how to use this method. So R and O, it means respiratory opposite. Whenever we're talking about respiratory, we're talking about the PaCO2. So that lab value goes with this part of the acronym. And then ME is metabolic equal. And when we're talking about the metabolic system, the lab value we're looking at is the bicarb, the HCO3. So that's gonna go with this part of the acronym. So now let's look at how we use these letters to get the answer to our ABG problem. So you wanna memorize this little chart here. And first off, we have the R and the O, which again is respiratory opposite. And we're particularly looking at two values with this. We're looking at the PaCO2 and the blood pH. And we're looking for them to be opposite of each other. So we're paying attention to which way the arrow is pointing, up or down. So one's gonna be up and one's gonna be down or vice versa. And if we have that presenting with our blood pH and that value, we have a respiratory problem. For instance, let's look at this. Okay, so we have a high PaCO2 and we have a low blood pH. That means we have respiratory acidosis because we know when our blood pH drops, it's acidic. And we know when we're keeping too much carbon dioxide, we're gonna have acidosis because CO2 helps create carbonic acid, which influences our hydrogen ion concentration, which makes us more acidic. Now, whenever we have a low PaCO2 and a high pH, we're gonna have respiratory alkalosis. So see how they're opposite. Those values are in opposite directions. Now let's look at our M and our E. So this is metabolic equal. And with metabolic, we're talking about the bicarb, the HCO3. So for this part of the method, we're talking about the bicarb and the blood pH. So they have to be equal, meaning they're going in the same direction. Either they're both high or they're both low. And if that's happening, we have a metabolic problem. So for instance, if we have a low bicarb and a low blood pH, we have metabolic acidosis. Or if we have a high bicarb and a high blood pH, we have metabolic alkalosis. Now to help you interpret these values, if they're high, low, or normal, you have to have the normal ranges memorized and what each range means. So let's quickly go over that. For blood pH, a normal blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45. This is the measurement of hydrogen ion concentration in our blood. So a value of less than 7.35 would be considered acidic and we would put a down arrow because it's down. If the blood pH is greater than 7.45, that is basic alkaline, it is elevated, so we would have an up arrow. Now for PaCO2, this is the amount of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood. A normal level is about 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. With respiratory, it's opposite, hence the part of our mnemonic or acronym that says respiratory opposite. So whenever we're talking about 35 to 45, it's like flipped what's going to be a base and what's going to be an acid, for instance. If it's greater than 45, that's considered an acid. So it's elevated because we have a lot of carbon dioxide in our body, so we would have an up arrow. Now, if it's less than 35, it's a base, and we have low CO2, so it's a down arrow. Don't let that confuse you. Commit that to memory. Make sure you grasp that because that'll help you whenever you're using this method to solve. Then we're gonna look over at the bicarb, the HCO3. A normal level of this is 22 to 26 milli equivalents. So this is gonna follow the same thing like how our blood pH did. So a level gr less than 22 is considered acidic, it's low, so we put a down arrow. And a level greater than 26 is considered basic alkaline and we would have an up arrow. Now let me quiz you on this. Let's see how well you grasp this. Okay, we have a blood pH of 7.23. 
What is that? It's acidic, so we would put a down arrow. Next, we have a PaCO2 of 32. Is this acidic, is it normal, or a base? It is a base, and because it's 32, it's low, so we would have a down arrow. Then we have a bicarb HCO3 of 18. What's this? This is an acid, and it's low, so we would have a down arrow. And then lastly, we have a PaCO2 of 51. What would this be? It is acidic, and because it's high, we would put an up arrow. Now let's solve some ABG problems using this method. So these problems I'm actually gonna solve come from a book I just released on ABG interpretation, which is a workbook that has a lot of cheat sheet style notes and extra practice problems so you can get proficient at solving these problems. Now let's look at our first problem. So it says we have a blood pH of 7.27, a PaCO2 of 42, and a bicarb HCO3 of 17. Very first thing what we wanna do is we want to set up this method. So we're gonna put R-O-M-E vertically, and then just over here to the side, we're gonna put our pH. Now what we wanna do is we wanna analyze that blood pH. Is it acidic, normal, or basic? So our blood pH is 7.27, that is low, so we're gonna put a down arrow, and it's acidic. So in parentheses, we're gonna put acid just so we can keep it straight. Then we're gonna look at the PaCO2. It's 42, a normal is 35 to 45. So this falls within that normal range. So next to R, because that is representing our PaCO2, we're just gonna put normal. Then we're gonna go look at that bicarb HCO3 at 17, a normal is 22 to 26. So this is on the low side, we're gonna put a down arrow next to the M, because that is the metabolic part. And we're gonna put in parentheses acid just to let us know it's an acid. Now, we're gonna look, do we have what we talked about earlier that we need to memorize that chart? Do we have respiratory opposite or metabolic equal? We have metabolic equal because notice, our bicarb is low and our blood pH is low. They're equal, they're same. Respiratory system was normal, so we don't even have that, so we have metabolic equal. So we're gonna put an X up here at the O and a check mark at the E. So based on all that, we have metabolic acidosis. Now we need to look and see if we have some type of compensation going on. So first off, we can look at for full compensation. And do we have full compensation? The answer is no, because our blood pH is abnormal. Our blood pH would have to be normal in order for us to have full compensation. And here in a moment, we'll be solving full compensation problems so you can get familiar with that. Now we need to move on. Do we have partial compensation or uncompensation? And the answer is it's uncompensated. And the reason we know is because we have a metabolic problem. So we're gonna look over at that respiratory system, seeing if it's trying to help balance it out, what's going on, because we have acidosis. Did the respiratory system try to make itself more alkaline by making that PaCO2 less than 35? It did not, so it's not trying to partially compensate. So here we have uncompensation. Now this problem says we have a blood pH of 7.55, a PaCO2 of 32, and an HCO3 of 18. So the first thing what we wanna do is we wanna write out our little acronym R-O-M-E vertically and then put a pH over here to the right. So first let's analyze our pH at 7.55. A normal is 7.35 to 7.45. So this is high. So next to pH, we're gonna put an up arrow and we're gonna put its basic, its alkaline. And then let's look at that PaCO2. It is 32. So over here on the R and the O part with the R, it is low because a normal is 35 to 45 and this is basic. So we're gonna put base in parentheses. Then we're gonna look at the bicarb, the HCO3. Normal is 22 to 26. This is on the low side, so down here at the M, we're gonna put a down arrow and put in parentheses that it's an acid. So let's think back to that chart we needed to memorize. Do we have respiratory opposite or metabolic equal? Well, let's look at that blood pH. It is elevated. Our respiratory PaCO2 is decreased, so we have respiratory opposite. So we definitely have a respiratory disorder. We don't have metabolic equal because notice our HCO3 is low and our pH is high. So they're opposite of each other. So we have respiratory opposite. And what we have is respiratory alkalosis. So we wanna determine if we have compensation or not. 
So first we can look to see if we have full compensation and we don't because our blood pH is abnormal. It is 7.55, normal 7.35, 7.45, so we can rule that out. But we need to determine do we have uncompensation or partial compensation. So we have a respiratory problem. Let's look at that metabolic system, the bicarb, to see if it's abnormal or normal because that can help tell us where we stand. So our bicarb HCO3 is 18. It's abnormal. It's on the acidic side. So we have alkalosis going on, respiratory. Therefore, the metabolic system try to make things a little bit more acidic so we can hopefully decrease that pH. So it's trying to compensate. So it would be respiratory alkalosis partial compensation. Now, if that bicarb was normal within that 22 to 26 range, it would be uncompensated. Our next problem says that we have a blood pH of 7.44, a PaCO2 of 49, and a bicarb of 33. So the first thing we're gonna do is write out Rome, R-O-M-E, vertically, and then put our blood pH over here to the right. So we want to first analyze that blood pH. It's 7.44, and normal is 7.35 to 7.45. So our blood pH is normal. So next to pH, we're gonna write normal. Now let's further analyze this blood pH because this should be tipping us off that we have full compensation. But to help us further solve the problem, we've got to analyze this blood pH just a little bit more. So an absolute normal blood pH right there in the middle is 7.40. Anything less than 7.40 is considered to be normal acidic blood pH. So it's on the acid side, so it would be low. And anything greater than 7.40 is elevated on the normal side. It's basic alkalotic. So here, ours is 7.44. So we would consider this normal, but it's basic, it's alkaline. So it's elevated normal. So we're gonna put a little up arrow right there and just put in parentheses base, cause it's on the base side. Then we're gonna look at the PaCO2. It is 49, Any a normal is 35 to 45. So it's on the high side. So we're gonna put an up arrow and we're gonna put it's on the acid. And then we're gonna look down at the bicarb, the HCO3, it's 33, and normals 22 to 26. So this is elevated, so where M is, we're going to put metabolic, we're gonna put an up arrow, and then we're gonna put in parentheses, it's a base, cause that's what that value is. Looking at our chart that we memorized earlier, we are looking for respiratory officer, metabolic equal, and based on that blood pH, it is equal with metabolic. They're both going in the same direction. So we have metabolic equal. We do not have a respiratory opposite because notice that those arrows are going in the same direction. So our answer is metabolic alkalosis. And we know that we have full compensation because our blood pH is normal. Okay, so that wraps up this video on using the Rome method to solve ABG problems. If you'd like more problems, you can access the free quiz in the description below.